Okay, so this talk, I'm going to continue with the previous one where I gave the general idea, the conceptual version of the chain rule for partial differentiation. But now it's going to, I'm going to write down a concrete expression for this. So I have, I have a bunch of inputs, n of them, little n here, there's all of these. Then have a bunch of intermediate variables. So each of these, u1, u2, to a un, is a function of the variables x1 to xn. It could be a function of all of them. We'll just assume that each one is a function of all of them. It may happen that, that say, u1 depends only on x2 and x5 and none of the others, but you just assume it's a function of all of them without loss of generality. Okay? And, uh, and the outputs, the w1 to wp, again, they depend on the intermediate variables. Okay? So how's that? Oh, okay, we have so many outputs. Yeah, but actually it doesn't matter because I'm just going to con concern myself with one particular output. Okay, one of these output variables. So I pick an i from 1 to p. That's just picking one of the outputs. And I pick a j from 1 to n. That's just picking one of the inputs. And I'm just interested in, in how that output depends on that input. So the other outputs in some sense don't matter. Uh -huh. Okay, so at, at any given time, I'm looking at only one output. Okay, there's something interesting which, which is not the topic for this video, but it's that, it's that, it's that the number of outputs doesn't affect the complexity of what you're doing. It's, so multiple outputs is not an issue because you can just study each one individually. The real complexity arises if you have multiple inputs. So, so the problem is with multiple inputs because if you have multiple outputs, you can just look at one at a time. Outputs don't affect each other. Right? If you have a factory produces two different things, they just go their own ways. If it requires two different inputs, there's some more complexity. So the complexity will arise from the fact that you have multiple inputs here and multiple intermediates here. So do intermediate medias interact with each other? Does that matter at the end way? Yeah, that's why we have to take partials. Right? We, have to, we have to use partials for... Uh, if you're doing second partials and all, then it would matter even more. But right now, it's just the first partials. So it's fine. So, this is going to be a summation over, over what? So, we have to add up if all the intermediates. So, the intermediates are from 1 to m. I'm going to use another letter k for the dummy variable of summation. k equals 1 to m. What's this going to be? The expression. Mm, the uk, the partials, partial derivative of uk with respect to w, uh, xj. Okay. Oh, that, that I'm right. Oh, the that's the part. second part. Yeah. I mean, that's fine. You can, I mean, that's, mm. it's commutative, so you could write mm -hmm. it either way, but I just, since I wrote it that way earlier. Yeah, okay. the first part would be the partials of wi with respect to uk. Yeah. Now, what's happening here? This is the partial of wi with respect to uk holding all the other u's constant. And this is the part of uk with respect to xj holding all the other x's constant. Okay, so it's a sum of m products, where m is the number of intermediate variables you're going through. And and these partials, of course, you know what, it's relative to holding the other constant. So that's that's the, that's a, this is actually the chain rule for partial differentiation if you're just composing, doing two levels of composition. Now you could imagine a, another type of uh, composition where you have more than two levels of composition. You have like three levels of course. You have in inputs, first level intermediate, second level intermediate, and output. In that case, you would have to find all parts, so you would have like a, a more complicated type of summation. Let me just make a pictorial thing which will make it clear how you will go. Let's, let's ignore the other inputs for now and all the other outputs. So, you just have one input xj, one output wi. You have all the intermediate variables. So these are all the inputs and uh, sorry, all the intermediate variables, the input and the output. Now, to figure out the partial of this, you have to figure out all the pathways through which the dependency manifests itself. Right? The dependency could occur through any of these guys. For each of these pathways, you have to figure out the partial derivative via that pathway, which is here. And then you have to add up, add up over all the pathways. Mm -hmm. Okay, now if I, if I had a, a two-stage type of thing, I won't do it in detail, but you can imagine you have first level intermediate, second level intermediate, and output. Then I have to do the summation over over all pathways, but now the pathways could be so you could have like different pathways, some which share some parts and don't share others. You have to add up over all of them. Right? So you'd have like 
it would be more complicated. And by n, like if yeah, you if you have, have m, these, these, if you have like m, m of the m and m prime, then you have m times m prime number of pathways to add up. Yeah, so it, it just gets a little more messy. You could, of course, you don't have to do it that way. You could, you could split it up as two chain rules, and then add up those chain rules. It just get a little messy. Uh, there's actually the one way of keeping track of these kinds of the expressions is using matrices and linear algebra. That's one of the advantages of using matrices and linear algebra. You can actually write, think of this as a product of a row matrix and a column matrix and things like that. So, so you could do, you could do it that way. But we we aren't going into that right now. But th that's a one reason why you see matrices once you start dealing with functions of many variables and derivatives.